Welcome to our vault visit at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania here at 13th and Locust Streets in Center City, Philadelphia. My name is Justina Barrett and I am delighted for you to join us this afternoon into a deep dive into the stories that our archives can tell. The Historical Society of Pennsylvania is proud to serve as Philadelphia's Library of American History. We have over 21 million documents, manuscripts, books, and graphic items that tell the stories of all Americans. We have particular strengths in early American history, family and ethnic history, and arts and culture. We are commemorating our 200th anniversary this year with a deep dive into some of our collecting strengths. One of them being the soul of America, performing literary and visual arts. And it is in that theme that we are hosting an exhibit on public art in Philadelphia, a legacy of women. This exhibit will be on view in our information common displays until March 15th. And on March 13th, we will be hosting artist, designer, and cultural activist Zenobia Bailey uh, for a signature artist talk. If you go to our website at hsp.org 200, you can have these details of all these programs. It is also in the vein of public art in Philadelphia that I'm delighted to invite my friend and colleague, Laura Keim, to come and talk to us about work she has done in our archives. Um, Laura is going to be visiting through our documents um, to reveal the story of Dinah of Stenton. Laura has been the curator at Stenton Mansion for nearly a quarter of a century. <laughs> she is also a, a lecturer in the Historic Preservation Program at the University of Pennsylvania. And she's going to share the story of Dinah and her life at Stenton with the Logan family. I'm so excited for you to take a look at the archives Thank you. and walk us through. Thank you so much. Thanks to have us. <laughs> well, and in the spirit of public art in Philadelphia, um, Part of why we're doing this program today and now also is because Stenton will be unveiling this new memorial to, to Dinah um, that you see here in stone. It's not quite finished. There are a few finishing touches left to come, but here you can see um, how it's situated in relationship to the house and um, our, our um, logos and sponsors here. April 20th, 2024 is the big unveiling. So please mark your calendars for that date. And it's just a little bit of background about um, this Dinah Memorial project. So Stenton um, already stewarded this plaque to Dinah from 1912 that called her out as the faithful colored caretaker of Stenton, who by her quick thought and presence of mind saved the mansion from burning by British soldiers in the winter of 1777. So that has been um, on in sort of, it was erected in Stenton Park in 1912 and then brought in, inside um, the historic site of Stenton, at least we know by about 1979 and has been stewarded as part of our collection by the National Society of Colonial Dames. We've also stewarded Stenton since 1899. In um, 20. 18, we unveiled on site this 1939 memorial to James Logan that had actually been erected outside the Ridgeway building of the library company. Um, and we were very conscious at that time about the, the conversation around um, memorials and enslavement and who do we honor in our America and wanting to do a proper job of putting these two stories one of um, enslavement and enslaver into conversation in the landscape of our site. So today I'm going to spend some time really delving into documents here at HSP. Interestingly, a couple of them are owned by the dames and on deposit, um, but that really give us a lot of detail about Dinah's life. And first I'll start with um, things that kind of give us the facts, really sort of give us some of the timeline. Um, and I just want you to keep in mind as we go along that we're dealing with two generations of the Logan family. So what you're not seeing here is what we call the first generation, the James Logan and his wife um, for whom the house was built and completed in 1730. We're going to focus instead on William Logan and Hannah Logan. Um, Dinah was Hannah's dower property. 
and then Dr. George Logan and his wife, Deborah Norris Logan. And in their generation, um, we are also going to hear other names today. Um, George's sister, Sarah Logan, married a man named Thomas Fisher. So just to give you kind of a little bit of that background. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that Dinah lived a lot of her life with the Logans in the Logan townhouse, not necessarily at Stenton all the time. The family went back and forth. And whereas the James Logan generation, once the house was complete, used Stenton as their primary residence, William Logan treated Philadelphia um, and this house that was on the corner of Second Street and then called Lodge Alley as their family's primary residence going out um, to the country, as it were, toward Germantown um, to be at Stenton. So I'm going to get started with some of the documents. Um, and the first thing I'll turn to is actually William Logan's will. And this is one of the documents owned by the Colonial Dames in Pennsylvania, inventory of his, his estate. So this includes um, the household inventories for Stenton and the townhouse and account of his executor, Thomas Fisher. So again, that's um, William's daughter, Sarah's husband. And we'll turn here. This gives us um, a good sense, actually, some real background for... Um, for Dinah's life. And, and the will was written in 1772. Uh, William did not die until the summer of 1776. It says, And I do hereby give further unto my said wife as her own property, the Negro woman Dinah and her grandchild Cyrus, having already set her daughter Bess free and desire they may not be deemed or valued as part of my estate. My said wife's father, George Emlyn, deceased, having given Dinah to her in his lifetime. More, and so that's, that's the end of this description of kind of Dinah's key family unit. It's actually, we, we, know, um, we know that there's this grandson, we know there's an already freed daughter, and we'd love to know more of the circumstances around which Bess was already free, um, but this gives us a sense of a family that, has, that lives and has lived, at least. We don't know um, where Bess may have gone yet, but that lived at Stenton. And so now we're just going to turn to um, an account of expenses. And this is, is an interesting little notebook um, because... It's, it does say expenses in Philadelphia, again, their primary residence, and someone came along, it looks almost like it might be the same handwriting that's on the will, um, William Logan, 1760. And then we're going to turn um, to this opening here. And right off the bat, since it's Women's History Month, I have to just say so often things are assumed to be related to the kind of male head of the house, when in fact, these are the expenses that Hannah Emlyn Logan was responsible for and is, is accounting for herself. And this is revealed here because this book says, to a pair of stays for myself, four pounds. Um, and what we're really interested in is that she has spent money, 15 shillings on a new gown for Dinah and stuff for a jacket for Jacob, 16 shillings. And Jacob is a name that um, I'm not familiar with. And it's one of these things, again, about going into the archives is that you see these, these documents are alive because it's related to how much our eyes can actually see and find. And this is a building story. And our research at Stenton and on slavery more broadly is an ongoing project. But I wonder, because we know Dinah had a husband, we're going to talk about in a minute, um, but we don't know his name, whether because he's purchased by the Logans in 1757 and this is 1760, whether in fact Jacob might not be Dinah's husband. And then just to give you a sense to here very briefly on the, the facing page, um, Hannah's logging to the washing woman for Stenton, 15 shillings. The same 
Price as Dinah's gown um, to the children's schooling, her sons George and Charles, to a poor woman, uh, to the monthly meeting, things like needles and tapes. So you're, you get a, a window into the things that the, you know, the wife of the household is, is responsible for related to milk or candles um, and so forth. And Dinah might have been assisting with some of those kinds of tasks. So um, for our next document, I'm just going to go to the iPad here because much as I'd like to say we could get all of Dinah's story at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, um, the Quaker archives have been really important too. And, and if you are researching enslaved people that were owned by Quakers, this is a very important um, resource to go to. This is a Quaker collection, special collection at Haverford College. And one of the p things we found there um, in, our, in a record book, because in 1755, the Quakers began to um, potentially read members out of meeting who were purchasing people. Um, so in 1757, William and Hannah Logan purchased Dinah's husband, and there's the whole record of the investigation of this event, including this phrase, he chose to live in his present situation with his wife. He was too ill to work, and his, um, his owner that was outside the Logan family um, wanted to, to sell him. And so it would seem he and Dinah probably together um, worked with Hannah and William and requested that they, they be brought together and brought some agency to this notion of uniting their family at Stenton. But as I said before, um, we haven't known his name and we don't quite know how long he lived, what the nature of his illness might have actually, um, actually been. And I'm also going to share with you just um, Dinah's actual manumission. And note this is an entirely handwritten manuscript. Um, and again, it's noted here that she having requested us to let her have her freedom. So Dinah had some agency in asking for her freedom, even though here 1776 is again kind of right up against, um, you know, the near last minute by a time by, um, by which Quakers really needed to manumit enslaved people to stay uh, members of the meeting. And this is the grandson Cyrus's manumission, the Negro boy named Cyrus. Um, and if you go to those, the, the manumission books, you see that many people are being freed at this time. And so no longer is this an entirely handwritten um, manuscript. It is a form that's being filled out. And Thomas Fisher here is one of the witnesses. But it actually is one of these um, where Cyrus is, is subject to a kind of um, gradual manumission in effect, that he is not actually free on the spot. He would only be free when he becomes 21. And we don't quite know when he's born, but we have another document that might... Um, to share with you that might shed a little bit of a clue um, on that for us. And I'm just going to turn back into the will here, which of course was um, fully administered in um, 1777. And in fact, there were some delays. Some of you may know that Thomas Fisher was um, one of a group of Philadelphia Quakers who were taken to Virginia during the American Revolution. And so he was unable to attend to his duties as executor um, at that time. But we can see here, um, eighth month of 1777, Negro Dinah in full for wages, 12 pounds. And it's interesting um, looking through this book too at wages that other people were, were making. And in fact, it, it seems to me that as a, a woman of color, as a black woman, um, and as, a, as female too, perhaps, that Dinah's wages, we think the 12 pounds is probably per year, and that she is not earning as much as um, a white man also was earning in the, in the, at the same time.
And so now we're going to turn to an interesting document that just came to light um, recently from a, a colleague of, of ours out nearby um, Stenton is LaSalle University. And one of the um, historians there was down here researching in the Logan Fisher Fox Papers. So I should say we looked at these things that are owned um, you know, by the colonial dames. Now we're turning to things that are in some of the the kind of greater um, Logan and related family papers at HSP. And this is a kind of one-off document in its folder. It doesn't, as far as I can tell at this juncture, there isn't a series of these accountings, but it is, it's, it's a kind of census in, and it's an account of the free Negroes who live within the limits of the monthly meeting for the Southern District of Philadelphia. And it, it, look, it records their names, by whom liberated, aged about, place of residence or with whom they live, an account of such as have families, um, the member of their children, there's nothing in, in that category, um, their occupations. And then the final column has questions, which there don't seem to necessarily be answers to, but that may have been asked. Um, at the time, such as like, you know, if they, if their children go to school, um, if they attend a house of worship, um, if they are, if they are prone to drink, in fact, would seem to be a concern. So it's interesting um, there. But what is so interesting for us at Stenton about this document is that three people here are recorded, um, including Dinah, with Stenton as if it is a surname. So we have um, Priamus Stenton, who was liberated um, by Hannah Logan. And he is in residence living with Thomas Fisher and is hired in his family. And we know we were able to find out that Thomas Fisher did leave him a small legacy. Um, and, and he used the name Priamus Stanton at the time of his death. He changed the E to an A. And so then we see Dinah Stenton liberated William and Hannah Logan. She's about 50. And this, this document doesn't have a date, I should say. Um, George Logan is where she, she's living at Stenton and that she's also hired in the family. And then Cyrus Stenton also liberated by William and Hannah, although technically it's just Hannah. And his age is recorded much more exactly at, at 12 because they're watching how old he is, keeping track until he'll be free when he's 21. And this notes to serve until he's 21. Um, so it, we, we, as I say, we don't know exactly when he's born, but certainly he's born by 1772 when William Logan made his will. And... Um, so we can kind of guess that this document is probably from the early 1780s, more or less. Um, and this has opened up, you know, new research trying to, to look for Dinah and her descendants with the last name Stenton or Stanton. Um, it seems if you go to the census records, too, that Cyrus might have also, like his, his um, grandmother, and we're about to see a not notation of her death, may have lived out his life at Stenton, so that's unclear. Um, but this pocket almanac here in um, the Belfield papers, and, the, and Belfield is a historic house that's now part of LaSalle University and where um, some later generations of the Logan family lived in the 20th century. And I'll just point, this one is actually stamped here so this was at Loudon, another um, family house on Germantown Avenue. Mariah Dickinson Logan stamp is there. And you can just see that there's missing front matter here, which is a little bit frustrating because it's in, in those title pages um, that it would say what the year was for this almanac. So, but I can't, I can't tell you enough how delighted my colleagues and I were to, to find this. We, we try to do some of our research as a, as a staff. We make field trips to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and other archives. Um, and this just, um, just blew us away. And we found this literally just before 
um, the world was about to shut down in um, the winter of 2020. So I'll read to you. February 21st, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, our very faithful and good old Dinah breathed her last, was buried the 23rd in my garden. She had requested during her lifetime to be interred at Stenton. And this just rather made our hearts kind of stop to, to really be able to document when, when she died. We knew it was in February, and then it required doing a little research on um, the back matter of this pocket almanac, the, the, what the, um, the governors were at the time, the cycles of the moon that show up here, to determine that Dinah died February 21st, 1805, and to be certain of that. And we knew a lot about her from, um, from family letters, too. And we knew up before we found this um, almanac reference that she was alive at least until 1803. And we did not pull out all of these, um, these letters today, but I'm just going to share with you some of these little quotes that give us um, a further sense of, um, of Dinah. So there's a letter um, from William Logan to his daughter, Sally, saying, Tell Dinah to be sure not to let them, and he's talking about a white peacock and a common peahen, get out or they will go away. So here's Dinah kind of minding what the Stenton menagerie of, um, of birds, as it were. Um, and many of these references come from Deborah Norris Logan. So that third generation after Dinah is free and employed um, with the family. But Deborah writes to her son, Albanus, who's away at school. Old Dinah begs thee not to forget her love. Um, Di uh, Deborah again to her mother. And she says, uh, and I rely on Dinah's attention to Gustavus, one of their sons. Please to remember me to the good old woman. Um, Deborah Logan to her mother, Mary Parker Norris. Um, but poor Dinah scalded her foot yesterday, which is interesting because this is also when Dinah is getting older. And so she's still performing some heavy labor and sustaining injury um, from her work. Deborah Norris Logan to her sons. We often talk of you, my dear boys, and wish for your company. Old Dinah remembers you with great affection. And then Deborah to her mother again. Um, I accordingly put on a morning gown and went down attended by Dinah. So Dinah kind of being with her as a kind of almost personal attendant. Um, and Deborah to her son, um, that they lost an, another servant named James Cross. He was an affectionate old servant. Our Dinah mourns after him, but the good old woman is pretty well in her health. And so from those quotes, you know, and all of those letters are here, and many of them are in the Mariah Dickinson Logan family papers here at HSP, um, bring a sense of life to that interaction of, um, of Dinah with the family, both through work, but through, um, through care and connection that lasted for, for two generations. And so the very kind of complicated nature of um, enslavement and continued employment. Um, and we've speculated that perhaps because Bess was already free, that Dinah actually made this choice to stay at Stenton in part because she's also looking after her grandson um, as, as part, of, part of that. And so I'm going to turn to the kind of um, the beginnings of the, the story of Dinah. Um, I, met, I alluded to it with the 1912 plaque and how Dinah was celebrated for saving um, Stenton from, from burning by British soldiers. And um, this is a, a fully bound kind of hard pasteboard book with this attractive watered cover here. And this is in the Loudon Papers. Um, and it's a, a manuscript that Deborah Logan wrote multiple copies of because within here she's alluding to, um, to various copies. And this one was um, owned at Loudon at some point by this, the second Albanus, or maybe the first Albanus, Charles Logan too, um, who did not live at Loudon. But she specifically mentions the different copies 
And these are somewhat typical of some of her kind of title pages, also from her diaries that are here at HSP. And fully scanned, you can find, if you like Deborah Logan and you're curious about her, you can, can find them um, on the HSP website. But this is, is sort of known as the memoir of Dr. George Logan. And um, a later great-granddaughter, Fanny Armat Logan, actually published it in, I think it was in 1899, through the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. But you can see here that um, Deborah is noting that this is 1821, that she begun this, this writing. And early on in the book here, we're um, on page 11, she records the story of the saving of the house, but she doesn't actually use the name Dinah. Um, and so she's talking about how Dr. George Logan kind of inherited it and how um, his house at Stenton had indeed been more fortunate than many other mansions in the neighborhood, for it had escaped being burnt by the British soldiery at the time that they fired Fairhill, another um, Norris family house, and 16 other seats and houses in its vicinity. And it seemed to owe its preservation to the presence of mind of an old domestic who had remained in it through all the vicissitudes of its serving for headquarters to both armies. On the memorable day that they committed the wanton de depredations, the two British soldiers came to the house and, as an act of special favor, desired the old woman if she possessed a bed or any furniture of her own to move it out directly, for they were going to burn the house. She remon remonstrated, but they were deaf to her oratory and went to the barn for some straw to effect their purpose. Happily that moment, an officer with a drawn sword in his hand galloped down the lane and inquired of the domestic if she could give them any intelligence requesting deserters. And so it's her intelligence of the um, so-called deserters. She says they're hiding out in the barn and this officer arrests the, the soldiers. And so it's her quick thinking that saves the house. Um, and the story lives on in a lot of 19th century local histories, including not the first edition, but the 1844 edition of John Fanning Watson's Annals of Philadelphia. Um, but he also doesn't use the name Dinah, and it's not until 1897 um, that uh, an antiquarian writer, Frank Willing Leach, pairs the name Dinah and the story of Stenton's being saved, which you know ultimately comes to have this life for, for Stenton and Stenton Park and the entire community um, through that 1912 plaque that, um, that I shared. And so um, I did want to just very briefly show you a picture of that as part of our, it's been cleaned. And this will be, this will be remounted on the new Dinah Memorial. So it's, it's been part of the design from the beginning and um, helps us to sort of see these layers of time and through this lens of colonial revival thinking and the description, the antiquarian kind of description that essentially is a sort of mid-Atlantic version of a faithful slave narrative calling out Dinah as the faithful colored caretaker of Stenton. And the new memorial um, is a space for ref reflection, a space that asks questions of Dinah and of us, and um, is, is a space that I hope you'll all come out and visit, if not on April 20th, this spring, um, sometime this, this year. And um, well, it feels like a big ending for us. That's been a big construction project, but it's really a new beginning for Stenton as um, our site is reoriented to greater levels of community um, engagement and, um, and all the things that we hope will happen in and around and because of the new Dyna Memorial. So I'm really grateful that you tuned in today. Come see the exhibit at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and um, see public art in Germantown and public art um, in Fairmount Park. And, um, and thank you very much.
We have a few questions in the chat. Okay. Um, someone asks, do we have any DNA, such as hair, to run to see who descendants may be? No. No. The only hair we have in our collection, and I don't know if HSP has any, is uh, we have some Deborah Logan hair, but we don't have any Dinah hair. Um, we could go poking around in the floorboards in the attic and see if there's anything there, but no, I wish we, I wish we did. Another question. The plaque looks good. Did Adam Jenkins conserve it? Indeed, Adam Jenkins was the conservator who cleaned and waxed it. And the um, there and a new um, plaque in the same style as the 1912 plaque is is being cast. That also says in memory of Dinah, and it has um, quotes from Alice Walker and Lorraine Hansberry. Healing begins where the wound was made. And never be afraid to sit a while and think. And this is, I think I forgot to mention that the memorial is entirely designed by um, local artist Karen Olivier. And she's so much more than just a local artist at this point. Um, she's really an internationally well-known artist. Um, and so we have a new plaque in the style of the old plaque. And they're trying to match the, um, the patina that Adam preserved on the 1912 plaque in, in the new one. Uh, one last question before we hop off. Um, someone says, I tuned in late. Do you know where Dinah is buried? That's a really good question that we also tried to find out as part of this project. So we had some funding for ground penetrating radar and we looked in the area in Stenton Park where the 1912 plaque had been erected on a granite plinth um, because specifically because um, there's an, an article in a in one of the Campbell collections at HSP here that, um, that details that Albanus Logan um, was believed that was the spot where Dinah was buried, and that is why. Um, but this ground penetrating radar did not find any um, human remains in that area. And of course, the almanac, as well as some other, other sources and letters, note that Dinah is buried under a tree, and we don't have any trees anymore that are older than 100 years. Um, but she's under a tree in Deborah Logan's garden, and we know the general vicinity of the property, and it, it could be on either in the park or kind of the historic site part of the landscape. But we sort of know the vicinity where Dinah could be buried and would like to do some more ground-penetrating radar um, to see what we can find. We have a few more questions, maybe uh, one more we'll take, and then any others we can pass along to Laura. Um, do you know more about Bess and Cyrus? I wish we knew more other than, um, so some of the census, the federal census records do, um, and it, it takes, I'm trying to remember now, but it's not the first one that necessarily records um, people of color. But there, when you start to count into the 19th century how many people of color were living at Stenton, it is possible that Cyrus is one of those people who stayed at Stenton for his lifetime. Um, so we're, there's more, hopefully, much more to come on that as well. And one final question. Uh, how are you balancing today's understanding of faithful, in quotes, slave, to how... Black people of yesteryear took pride in being considered responsible. Hmm. Yeah. Well, th that's a really good question. I would, you know, it's really interesting to me that faithful is both language that Deborah Logan uses in the pocket almanac, our very faithful Dinah breathed her last. Um, and it is, I, th I think, a very kind of colonial revival notion that we carry throughout the 19th century. Um, and you see it on that plaque and in other faithful slave narratives. Um, so that we've been thinking about it a lot more in, in terms of like the way that word is used over time. Um, and it's hard to say whether how Dinah thought about being responsible um, was saving the house potentially something that she did simply because it was the responsible thing to do in her mind, or is it because it's her home um, we, there is a question on the memorial. So there are these series of questions and one of them, um, and this came from some of you on the call could possibly know, um, unfortunately she's deceased now, but local storyteller, Denise Valentine, um, do you wish you had let it burn? 
is one of one of the questions. And then the analogous question for for us is, would you have saved Stenton? So, um, yeah, responsibility is a hard, a hard question. Thank you so much, Laura. You're welcome. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much Thank for you, coming here and for breathing life into the documents. 21 million. I know the Logan collection is not quite 21 million, but it's it's close to that. And it takes a lot of your expertise and your staff's expertise to come back and look again and again and see things maybe you didn't see the first time. Um, we invite everybody to come to 13th and Locust and do the same kind of research. You are welcome in our reading room to get these boxes, to get these documents and do, do your own research here. And I, I, I have to say, we could not do what we do at Stenton to tell rich history and story if, if it were not for HSP. And we are not an archive. You know, we don't have air conditioning. Um, that takes a lot to, to run a proper archive. And the accessibility is here. And so we are so grateful always to HSP for, for keeping all of this. Yeah. Well, that's, that's public history. It takes all of us doing that work. It takes you coming in here and, and looking with your eyes and telling your stories as well. So check us out, hsp.org. Check us out, stenton.org. Stenton and there's a slash Dinah yeah, for our, our Dinah page. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank Have you. Have a great afternoon, folks. Thank you so much.